um, the government and the opposition are supposed to negotiate. Now, I think it's likely that the opposition, because of their extremism and their stupidity, will probably torpedo that one and they'll take the opprobrium of doing so on themselves because they're going to say, we don't talk to Assad, whereas the government is going to be much cagier with Assad and say, well, uh, you know, let's see. And then they'll find ways to play out the string. And then eventually this opposition will say, well, that's it. We don't talk to bloody dictators as they turn with their hands uh, dripping with blood and also chemical weapons, which they uh, deployed. And then there's supposed to be elections under United Nations supervision. The same problem returns. Can Assad be a candidate? Because he'd probably win. Um, so um, the, the other question is the, the dividing line sometimes in a little bit more granular, fine-grained form, what's the dividing line between a terrorist and a wonderful hero of democracy in the opposition? I'll tell you what it is. Terrorists are in the countryside with Kalashnikovs, and the opposition is in the parliament because they ran for office, and some of them got in to the parliament. Now, um, there is um, some uh, effort here to um, portray, in other words, to to uh, expose this ISIS oil traffic, right? It's the ISIS Bilal Erdogan Erdogan um, traffic in oil. We, we're informed now that uh, an, an oil tanker loaded with oil has actually arrived on the southern coast of France, as is is being unloaded, right? Uh, isn't aren't the French gendarmes always so so vigilant when it comes to terrorism? Aren't they going to seize that vessel? Because maybe there are um, lawsuits by the victims of the Paris November 13th bombings. Maybe they want to sue ISIS. Well, you get the hold of that ship and that oil, and uh, that would become uh, an object. So that's um, certainly happening. Uh, we've also got uh, some uh, progress on the uh, on the fighting front. I've got to talk about Mosul, Bomadi, a couple of these. Back in a minute, World Crisis Radio, Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. Now, with Christmas coming and other holiday events, uh, time to take a look at tarpley.net and look at that column of books of mine down the right-hand side of the page and ask yourself, have you got a complete set? You better get one. You should buy every one of those if you don't have it. And... Of course, as gifts, right? You want to enlighten your reactionary uncle, right? The one who always gives you a hard time about what limp paw has been saying on the radio or uh, who is this pawn vanity, as he's sometimes known. Um, the uh, tired uh, and uh, superannuated correspondent of Fox News, right? But still as reactionary as ever. If you want to bring a little light, right? into their thinking processes than my books. And if you want to support this program, the quickest, easiest way to do it, if I've been able to uh, inform you of anything, teach you anything, inspire you to anything this year, please go and get some of those, some of those books. Now, um, any number of other things uh, going on. Uh, we've had a, um, a, a, a counterattack by the ISIS uh, people in northwestern Iraq. So this is uh, they're they're attacking the um, the Peshmerga essentially, or, or better yet, the YPG and Peshmerga, who have been important in the liberation of Sinjar back on November 11th. Right, the city of Sinjar was taken in 24 to 48 hours, really one day. Uh, and, of course, all the commentators are trying to say, that's not typical. ISIS is really much stronger. That was a tactical retreat by ISIS. Okay, fine. But as Churchill pointed out after Dunkirk, you don't win wars by making successful retreats. So that's a defeat for ISIS. Now, the, the uh, NPR characters, right, National Pentagon Radio, are complaining this morning that the siege of Ramadi is going too slow. Well, that's siege warfare. Ask the famous Vauban. B-A-U-B-A-N of France, right? The guy who basically set the stage for the uh, 
the modern kind of uh, fortifications, they'll tell you siege warfare is going to be slow because you can't get your own people killed. Oh, then there's Mosul, right? We have a whole story around Mosul, which is that Erdogan and Davu told you had, of course, uh, shipped in um, about a thousand Turkish soldiers and about 25 or 35 tanks and put them in northern Iraq, albeit in the Kurdish zone. Now, they've done that. They've been doing that for 20 years. Uh, but the idea here is that the Turks want to support the worst of the Kurds. The worst of the Kurds is Barzani. Barzani. And the word on him is always tied to Netanyahu and the Israelis, but also very dirty in his own right. Now, on the ground, the reality seems to be that with Sinjar cut off and the terrorists, uh, the ISIS people, are forced to fall back on a different supply route, the city of Mosul, which I believe is the biggest city in the caliphate, is going to be liberated soon. The idea now is Erdogan and Davut told you want to have a Turkish military unit nearby, but not do any fighting, of course. When the, the YPG people and the honest Kurds, let's call them, when they do the work and liberate Mosul from the ISIS terrorists, then those Turkish forces are going to be thrust in there with a, a you know a quick coup de main, and they're going to take over the city, and then they'll give it back to uh, this uh, this awful Barzani. Get the idea? Now that's a very dirty thing, and of course it's an invasion, right? If if the president, uh, if the prime minister Abadi of Iraq says, get out, you have to get out. Erdogan says, no, I'll never do it because we fight terrorism. Well, you obviously, this is simply a, a cover for aggression, right, as such charges often are. So um, this week we've had Vice President Joe Biden saying, hey, got to get those Turkish forces out of northern Iraq. And now finally the White House says the same thing. The United States government officially wants the, the Turks to get out of northern Iraq. Now that's going to be a very, very interesting one to follow. But what it shows is that the city of Mosul could be liberated from one week to the next, but not on National Pentagon Radio. Over here we have um, a, uh, a warrior princess, I guess, who says, gosh, the uh, the uh, liberation of Mosul is not going to be quick. It's going to take two to three years. Well, that's better than the 20 years we've been hearing from defeatist generals of the Petraeus Allen faction. But this is this is just crazy. There is no way to make these kinds of uh, of estimates. So the ISIS was counterattacking and the Iraqi government called in airstrikes and uh it looks like some, some Iraqi troops, 20 or 30 Iraqi troops, got killed by friendly fire, which is, of course, much to be lamented. But I, uh, I would be very skeptical. I'd be very leery of news operations that focused only on that and not on this entire context. So the Peshmerga, unfortunately, are not the good guys. They seem to be controlled more or less by Barzani. That's his army, in effect. Uh, YPG, of course, that's the uh, that's the best you're going to find among the Kurds. Now, we probably uh, mention a couple of more things about the Middle East, but I think that's that's pretty much going to do it. Now, oh, the the future perspective. Now, here's what we're hoping for: the Syrian Arab army is preparing a spring offensive. And spring over there means, you know, January, February, right? The Mediterranean is like that. So the idea is that there's going to be an uprising in Syria. There's going to be a mass uprising, a rebellion, a broad-based rebellion. And again, think of Verdi's I Vespri Siciliani, the Sicilian Vespers, which was a rebellion of the Italians of Sicily against 
the Norman French occupation and the French were kicked out. So get get yourself a nice Sicilian Vespers uh, as a Christmas present. Right? The, um, the Metropolitan Opera opened with that, I think, in 2004, 2005, meaning that the U.S. had better watch out. So the point the point being that the accurate way to describe this area controlled by the both by ISIS, Al Qaeda, Saudi. So it's the ISIS controlled by the U.S. and now in the hands of the Saudis and the Turks. Al Qaeda, U.S., Saudis taking over now in Turks, and the 300 different uh, lunatic uh, terrorist groups. They're, most of them are foreigners. They're not Syrians. Syrians are different. Syrians are tolerant. Syrians have Alawites. They have Shiites. They have Sunnis. They have Kurds. They have Druzes. They have Christians of all kinds, Maronite, Melkite, Syriac, uh, Antiochian, all kinds. That's Syria. That's why Syria is such a valuable and likable country. But uh, of course, the U.S., uh, you know, from Henry Kissinger looking at Lebanon in 1975 till today, it's still largely the same thing. But the point is, those terrorists are foreigners. And what's going to unfold in front of the eyes of the world is a rebellion where it's clear that it's the Syrians against the foreigners and that the Syrians are fundamentally moderate and the foreigners are essentially the killers. So this is uh, now going on. And we wish them well. We hope that they'll get plenty of Russian air support and indeed they should get U.S. air support. Air support. Let's talk to here in Washington, D.C. It is, by the way, the afternoon of the 18th of December 2015. Now, President Putin of Russia, obviously one of our favorite people, held his press conference, his year-ending press conference, he had his yesterday. Obama's going on right now, so I can't tell you what Obama is actually uh, saying. We'll have to include that. Um, if anything of note comes out of that, we'll we'll have it for you next time. But this is now Putin's year-end press conference. Now, in, in lo- lot of uh, a lot of talk about, frankly, the Russian domestic economic difficulties. Can't blame that on Putin. At least you can't blame a lot of it on Putin because those are economic sanctions, right? Obviously, Putinism. On the one hand, the state apparatus, the power ministry is the Siloviki, and on the other hand, the oligarchs, right, who run the economy. So this is not a viable model. No, nobody in his right mind could say that uh, Russia under Putin has found the formula that will allow human civilization to go to a higher level. It is simply not true. There's nothing uh, about that that would recommend it to anybody that's not already under that yoke. But now... Putin talked about U.S. politics. Oh, we're always interested. So he talks about Donald Trump. He's asked about Donald Trump. Quote, Putin says, he is a very bright person, talented without any doubt. It is not our business to assess his worthiness, comma, but he is the absolute leader of the presidential race. He says he wants to move to a different level of relations, a fuller, deeper level with Russia. How can we not welcome this? Of course we welcome this. On domestic politics, his manner of speaking, what he employs to raise his popularity, that is none of Russia's business. It is not our concern to evaluate his work. Well, I'm afraid this is deeply problematic. This is a tragic misunderstanding, tragically wrong and dangerously wrong about Trump. And it introduces the entire question of Do Russian politicians specifically understand the United States? And based on this, I would say not enough. Uh, In some cases, clearly no. I would recommend to Putin, figure out who told you to say that, right? Where did you get that opinion? Because there is this thing called the collective Putin, right? He's he's not just one person. He's a, he's a, a group, right? It's like a college of advisors. But... This is simply wrong, and again, dangerously wrong. And uh, let's just start with the facts. Trump would be the, quote, absolute leader of the presidential stakes race. Who told you that? That's crazy. That's not right. It's simply not accurate. Let's look at 
real clear politics, right? You can find all this on uh, tarpley.net, by the way. Stop off on the way to buy books for the holiday 